Let's begin with the quadratic equation, a polynomial equation of this form, where a, b, and c are constants, and a cannot equal zero. Solving the equation means finding the values of x that make the equation true. These values are called roots. To find these roots, we use the quadratic formula. It calculates the exact value of x by substituting the coefficients a, b, and c from the equation into the formula. That's all simple when we talk about squared values, but will it work when they are cubed? What happens when we have a cubic equation? After much hard work, it was discovered that the roots can be found using this extremely complicated formula. I'm not even going to try to read that. Apart from being really complicated, here's something really weird about it. It looks like the equation gives us 9 solutions, not 3. Cubic equations should give us 3 roots as a solution. But because there are 2 square root signs, ignoring the one in the denominator, it looks as though we get 9 roots from the formula. But among these 9 potential roots, only 3 of them will actually be solutions. The task is then to select the correct three roots that'll solve the equation. Not all combinations will satisfy the equation, even though they mathematically emerge from the applied formula. In order to check if it's valid, you'd have to substitute it back into the equation. Anyway, mathematicians went on to develop an even more complicated formula for quartics. Yeah, don't even bother looking at it for too long. Once mathematicians discovered how to solve for quartics, they began looking for the formula for quintics. It was then that Niels Henrik Abel and Paolo Ruffini took on the challenge and found out that there is no formula, like the quadratic, cubic, or quartic formula for polynomials of degree more than or equal to 5. That is, solutions involving only nth roots. Multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction. This in itself was already incredible, but Evaris Galois went further. Say f is a polynomial, which we can write out in this form. q is the set of rational numbers, so numbers that can be expressed as a fraction of integers. Let f be a polynomial over q. It means that f's coefficients have to be rational numbers. In order to solve for quintic equations, f needs to be solvable by radicals. When we say radical, we speak of squared roots, cubed roots, and so on. But we also speak about roots of polynomials. To differentiate between these two usages, we will use the word radical for square roots, etc. Polynomial is solvable by radicals if its solutions, or the roots, can be expressed using rational numbers, arithmetic operations, and taking kth roots. In other words, if you can write the roots of the polynomial using these operations, then the polynomial is solvable by radicals. There are obviously additional nuances and ways to make the definition more precise, but for the sake of time, we won't explore them. Galois observed that the roots of a polynomial equation show certain symmetries, and these symmetries can be described by mathematical objects called groups. In Galois theory, we don't really jump from polynomials to groups, but go via the intermediate stage of field extensions. But, because this is an overview to give you an idea, we won't delve into field extensions. But if you're interested in a video about that, leave a comment below. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Let's therefore define what is a Galois group. Remember, f is a polynomial whose coefficients are rational numbers. We established that. Now let's talk about symmetries, which we will define as an element sigma in sk. Sk is a symmetric group, which is the set of all permutations of the roots of a polynomial that leaves the polynomial's relationships unchanged. Let me explain. Consider a polynomial f of x with distinct roots alpha1, alpha2, alpha3, and so on until alpha k. These are the values of x for which f of x equals 0. A permutation is a way of rearranging the elements of a set. For example, if we have three roots, alpha 1, 2, and 3, the set of all possible rearrangements of these roots is called the permutations of the roots. For three roots, alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3, here are some permutations. No change. Swap alpha 2 and alpha 3. Swap alpha 1 and alpha 2, and so on. If we have a set of k elements, say 1, 2, 3, and so on, and 2k, then sk includes every possible ordering of these elements. Sigma is a permutation within sk. If you pick any permutation in sk, you can call it sigma. Sigma represents one unique way to rearrange k elements. Together, we can establish what is a Galois group of f. 
In the equation, we see the original ordered set of roots alpha 1 and so on to alpha k and the reordered set of roots according to the permutation alpha sigma 1 to alpha sigma k. They are conjugate because they both satisfy the same polynomial f. That's what a Galois group of f is. Simply put, but in order to relate to f being solved by radicals, the Galois group of f needs to be solvable in itself. What does that mean? First, let's focus on what a group is. A group is a set of elements combined with an operation that satisfies four properties. In set G, closure. The sum of any two integers is an integer. Associativity, a plus b plus c equals a plus b plus c for any integers a, b, c, and g. Identity element. The number is 0 because a plus 0 equals a for any integer a in g. Inverse element. For any integer a, the inverse is negative a because a plus negative a equals 0. But there's another thing we need to know that hasn't popped up. The other three types of groups, first of which are abelian. An abelian group is a group where the operation is commutative. a times b equals b times a for any elements a and b in the group. Next is a normal subgroup. A normal subgroup n of a group G is a subgroup that satisfies a special property for every element G in the group capital G and every element N in the subgroup capital N, the element G N, the inverse of G, is still in the subgroup N. In symbols, we can say that G N, the inverse of G, belongs to the subgroup N for all element G of the group and for all element N of the subgroup. A counterexample of that, in other words, of a subgroup of a group that is not normal is h equals to the identity element and r squared in the dihedral group D8. Can you tell why? Let me know in the comments section your thoughts about it, or if you need a deeper explanation on it. And lastly, we have the quotient group. Given a normal subgroup n of g, the quotient group g slash n is the set of cosets of n in g. For an element in the group G, the coset Gn is just the set Gn for every element n in the subgroup capital N. The quotient group G slash n is the set of all such cosets, with a group operation defined as the following. Now a group G is solvable if there exists a series of subgroups from the trivial group, so the group consisting only of the identity element, to the group G. That's the way we represent it, where each gi is a normal subgroup of gi plus 1, and the quotient groups gi plus 1 slash gi are abelian. The Galois group of a polynomial f being solvable means that there is a chain of subgroups, where each subgroup is normal in the next one, and each quotient group gi plus 1 slash gi is abelian. This is where we are able to connect the two sides of what we will call the Galois theorem. Galois theorem says, let f be a polynomial over the rational numbers. Then, f is solvable by radicals if and only if the Galois group of this polynomial is a solvable group. Mind that, the fundamental theorem of Galois theory looks quite different, but we won't get into it here. If you can break down the Galois group into simpler parts, then you can also break down the polynomial's roots into simpler parts, using basic arithmetic and radicals. Galois' theorem is a much better explanation than the one given by Abel and Ruffini, because Abel and Ruffini stated that there is no formula that will give a solution to every quintic equation. But Galois found a way to determine which quintics, or higher, can be solved by radicals and which cannot. Consider the polynomial f of x equals x to the power of 5 minus x. This polynomial has the roots 0 plus and minus 1 plus and minus i, where i is the imaginary unit. So the roots are 0, 1, minus 1, i and minus i. These roots can be expressed using basic arithmetic and square roots, which are radicals. The Galois group of this polynomial is a subgroup of the symmetric group S5. In this case, the Galois group is D4, the dihedral group of order 8, which is known to be solvable. Since the roots can be expressed using the square roots, the polynomial is solvable by radicals. The solvability of the Galois group means that there exists a series of normal subgroups with abelian quotients. Now consider the polynomial g of x equals x to the power of 5 minus 6 x plus 3. The Galois group of this polynomial is typically S5, the full symmetric group on 5 elements. 
The symmetric group S5 is not solvable because it does not have a series of normal subgroups where each quotient is abelian. Specifically, S5 does not have a normal subgroup structure that reduces to abelian groups through successive quotients. Since the Galois group of this polynomial G is not solvable, the polynomial G of X cannot be solved by radicals. This video was inspired by these course notes by Tom Leinster from the University of Edinburgh. Link in the description below. If you like this video, I'm sure you're going to love this one. See you there.